Greetings, greetings, everyone. I'm Linda Hartling. I'm the Director of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies. And in our not so hierarchical organization, director really means I work in direct collaboration with whatever needs to be done, but specifically in collaboration with our founding president, Evelyn Lindner. I'm thrilled to be with you here, even though I wish I could be with you in person, but I'm currently doing relational care work, dignity work, in Portland, Oregon, caring for my 94-year-old father and my 80-year-old husband, both of whom are truly medical miracles who survived some really major health crises. As many of you know from firsthand experience, care work is crucial to dignity work, but it's often invisible. And in my view, this kind of relational work, this care work, it makes all other work possible. So I wish I could be with you, but I'm so glad to be with you on video. Today, I'm introducing the relational methodology we use for exploring the tough, tough topic of humiliation. It's called the frame of appreciative inquiry. Don Klein, one of our founding members of our community, and one of the scholars who wrote some of the earliest papers on humiliation introduced us to this approach. It was originally created by David Cooper Ryder and his colleagues at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio, but it's a strength-based research and organizational methodology that really has helped us create these kinds of conversations. And we've adopted it and adapted it for our global conferences to facilitate collaboration, community building, and mutually dignifying dialogue. However, Don would warn us that appreciative inquiry should not be confused with engaging in happy talk or practicing optimism or being starry-eyed optimists. It's really about creating conditions for being authentic authentic, and connected in our diversity and in dignity. We know, as former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan says, all cruel and brutal things, even genocide, start with the humiliation of one individual. And we join His Royal Highness Prince El Hassan bin Talal, who says, the time has come for redefining the conduct of our relations, our relations with each other, and our relationships with our planet Earth. As Evelyn says, we are living in times when nothing short of global cooperation can successfully address the urgent problems developing in the world today. And we've learned from our work that we are all vulnerable human beings like the title of our conference, Global Vulnerability. But there's good news about vulnerability, according to Brene Brown. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. This is the type of dignity and understanding of vulnerability we hope we can bring into this community and this conference. One great example of meeting in vulnerability as an opportunity comes from the wonderful work of Stephanie Knox Steiner, who was brought to us by Phil Brown. Stephanie and her students at the UN mandated diversity for peace in Costa Rica, they have been striving to create caring communities through their peace education work. Yet they know the challenge. Their statement for their work describes how they sit in the tension of awareness that our peace education efforts are not enough alone, but that united with others around the world, working towards a more peaceful, just, and liberated future for all, our actions matter. They are relational role models. We like to think we're building a global nest of scholars, activists, researchers, educators, artists, and others from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, dedicated to ending cycles of humiliation and cultivating the dignity of all people while we do everything we can to protect the planet. We are a digna community, as Chippewan Chowdhury pointed out early on, generating courage through our connection. So let me tell you how we go about beginning a conversation on the dynamics of humiliation, utilizing our appreciative inquiry approach. 
Now, Dan would tell us that the easiest way to think about the appreciative inquiry approach is just come into this work with a sense of awe and wonder and curiosity, with a sense of openness, the same kind of awe and wonder you would experience if you saw a beautiful sunrise. But we asked him, well, what does that look like in practice? And this is what it means to us in our community. The first big idea behind the frame of appreciative inquiry is relationships come first. We're interested in two-way relationships that are mutually beneficial rather than the old common approach to one-way relationships. We've moved away from the lecture presentation format to create more mutually beneficial two-way relationships. And the relational approach begins with listening others into voice. So the first step of appreciative inquiry is to practice relationships come first. Now, that's not just any type of relationships. My mentor, Jean Baker Miller, was a psychiatrist who had a globally popular book on psychological development, talked about growth fostering relationships. She identified the five good qualities of a growth fostering relationship when she says, when you're in that kind of a relationship, you feel a sense of zest or energy in the relationship that leads both people in the relationship to feel mutually empowered to take action on behalf of yourself and others, that leads to greater clarity and knowledge about yourself and others, that leads to increased sense of worth, that leads to a desire for more connection. These are the five good things that characterize a growth fostering relationship based on Jean's 50 years of clinical practice. So relationships come first in the R appreciative approach. The second big idea that informs this approach is that none of us is as smart as all of us. This honors that each one of us has something important to contribute to this meeting. And we all contribute in different ways. We try to include the spirit of Ubuntu that was brought to us by Emmanuel Dahamana in Rwanda. Everyone who is in this meeting has something important to contribute. That's why we moved beyond the typical academic debate format and moved in the direction of dialogue, dignifying dialogue. Mike Miller, a sociologist, suggests that debate sometimes changes people's minds, but not very often. And we see this every day on TV, especially in America. So we strive to practice dignifying dialogue. This includes learning to disagree without being disagreeable, to disagree with dignity. And Mike Miller would help us by recommending that we ask ourselves, how can I deepen my understanding by listening and contributing to the discussion? Or how can I move the dialogue forward so that we all can benefit from it and move to a new place. That's what we call dignity plus dialogue or dignologue. So why do we focus so much on dignifying dialogue? Because we are always working with the elephant in the room. We are always working with the dynamics of humiliation. We know we will make mistakes, we'll step on each other's toes, we'll mispronounce names, but we can apologize and help each other up so we can move forward together. Ella Aute made this beautiful graphic that emphasizes that moving away from humiliation means moving toward mutuality in relationships. We strive to move in that direction because we have worked for caring collaboration, connected cooperation, and global community rather than competitive detachment that inflicts so much humiliation Individually, we know we are just one drop, but together we are an ocean. Bring your best sense of openness, of awe and wonder into this workshop. Remember, relationships come first. Remember, the dignifying dialogue can be a benefit to everyone engaged in the conversation. With your help, we can build a world without humiliation that dignifies us all.